is truly a privilege to gather with, uh, with like-minded people, uh, servants of yours, uh, studying your word. We ask that you bless our fellowship and our scripture study this evening as we pray as your humble servants. Amen. Amen. Okay, there are a couple things uh, Josh Escoffier asked about. Let's look at Passover, uh, the Easter type thing, which is Easter coming up pretty quick, isn't it? It's about a month before Passover this year, yeah. which the two, the timing for the two is not related, really. But uh, uh, Easter is, I believe it's the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. I believe that's what Easter is. So uh, that's coming up. And I want to talk about the pagan origins of Easter. And I don't want people to think that I'm saying that Easter was intended to be pagan. It sure was not. It was not intended to be pagan. But the elements of it, and many things about it, have extremely pagan origins. And we're going to look at that. Uh, the name Easter can be traced back to the name of Astarte, the Syrian sun goddess known as the Queen of Heaven. Now, where does it mention Easter in the Bible? Right, it doesn't. The King James mistranslates Pascha one time in the book of Acts as Easter for some reason. Uh, but Pascha, believe it or not, is not difficult to figure out that that's a Greek term meaning Passover. But uh, uh, that's, just, that's just what they did. Well, at the end of the winter, the season changes because the earth tilts on its, uh, as it rotates on its axis. Spring arrives when the sun is over the equator. On the first day of spring, known as the vernal equinox, which means spring equal night, both day and night are an equal 12 hours long, which meant that the long winter nights were over and the sun again began to take control. This time was marked by celebrations and festivals to thank the pagan gods. These ancient rituals were fertility festivals observed in hopes that the gods would bless them with fertile flocks and fields, Animal and child sacrifices were offered to the gods to receive this favor. Now, a venerable bead, an 8th century Christian historian, indicated that the name Easter came from the festival of, of Oster, uh, also found as Oster and Ostara, the Anglo-Saxon goddess of spring and fertility. There was also a Teutonic or Germanic goddess known as uh, Oster, and also known as Easter or Esther. Now, who was the goddess of dawn and light, fertility, and spring? It's from these deities where the name Easter actually originates. The festival in her honor was held by the uh, held during the vernal equinox. <clears throat> and these things are referenced. Uh, you know, you get a lot of information about a lot of the uh, pagan origins that are involved in Christianity from the Catholic Encyclopedia. They readily admit this. Um, but they don't care. I mean, they, 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 we Christianize it there. It's all better now. <clears throat> now, the English word Easter and the German Oster come from a common <clears throat> origin. Uh, Easter, Oster, Ostara, Osar, which to the Norsemen meant the season of the rising or growing sun, the season of new birth. The word was used by our ancestors to designate the feast of new life in the spring. The same root is found in the name for the place where the sun rises, east or ost. The word Easter then originally meant the celebration of the spring sun, which had its birth in the east and brought up new life upon earth. Hence the term Easter, because when you have sunrise service on uh, Sunday morning on Easter, where do, you, where do you look toward? The east, the rising sun. <clears throat> the symbolism was transferred to the supernatural meaning of our Easter, to the new life of the risen Christ, the eternal and uncreated light. Based on a passage in the writings of St. Benny the Venerable, the term Easter has often been explained as the name of an Anglo-Saxon goddess, Eoster, though no such goddess is known in the mythologies of any Germanic tribe. Modern research has made it quite clear that St. Bede erroneously interpreted the name of the season as that of a goddess. And that's uh, out of the Handbook of Christian Feasts and Customs. 
Ostara around March 21st, but they may vary by more than two days, also known as Spring Equinox and all those other names. The first true day of spring tide, the days and nights are now equal in length as the young god continues to mature and grow. We begin to see shoots of new growth and swelling buds on the trees. Energy is building as the days become warmer with promise. <clears throat> it comes from a book called, you call it Easter, we call it Ostara by Peg Hello. Try this sometime with your children or a young niece, nephew or cousin on the day of the vernal or autumnal equinox, just a few moments before the exact moment of the equinox, which comes from the witch's voice, the eight pagan holidays. Uh, a lot of the Christian calendar really is based upon uh, a, a, a pagan calendar, which uh, honors the equinox and other uh, other times of the year. Now, what means the term Easter itself? It's not a Christian thing. It bears a Chaldean origin in its very forehead. It's nothing else than Astarte, one of the titles of Beltus, the Queen of Heaven, whose name as pronounced by the people of Nineveh, was evidently identical with that now in common use in this country. That name was found by Layard in the Assyrian monuments is Ishtar. And that comes from the two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. And this, this book has received a lot of criticism because in this book, the, the Reverend Alexander Hislop has found pagan origins to many things in Christianity. That's what the book's about. And he was a, a believer himself. And he was a historian, and people say, well, he uh, was erroneous in a lot of his work, and I have not really seen any proof of that. He's done very well, in my opinion. The 11th edition of Encyclopedia Britannica's Easter article states, there's no indication of the observance of the Easter festival in the New Testament or in the writings of the Apostolic Church Fathers. The ecclesiastical historian Socrates has quoted the same article as he points out that neither the Lord or his disciples, or excuse me, apostles, enjoined the keeping of this day. He says the apostles had no thought of appointing festival days, but of promoting a life of blamelessness and piety. He attributes the observance of Easter by the church to the per perpetuation of an old usage, just as many other customs have been established. Early church reformers such as Calvin and Knox protested strongly against Easter because of its pagan origins. Observance of the holiday was not wild, widely celebrated in America until well after the Civil War, which is fascinating. Easter's long been known to be a pagan festival. America's founders knew this. A children's book about the holiday, Easter Parade Welcome Sweet Springtime by Steve Englehart, page four, states when the Puritans came to North America, they regarded the celebration of Easter and the celebration of Christmas with suspicion. They knew the pagans had celebrated the return of spring long before Christians celebrated Easter. For the first 200 years of European life in North America, only a few states, mostly in the South, paid much attention to Easter. Not till after the Civil War did Americans begin celebrating this holiday. Easter first became an American tradition in the 1870s. The original 13 colonies of America began as a Christian nation with the cry of no king but King Jesus. Uh, the nation did not observe Easter within an entire century of its founding. What happened to change this? Good question. <coughs> Astarte, or Easter worship, was always associated with the worship of Baal or sun worship. Astarte was Baal's wife. Notice another name for Astarte. It was Ashtaroth. The following quote makes this clear. What means the, East, the term Easter itself? It's not a Christian name. It bears a Chaldean origin on its, on its forehead, as we mentioned. Easter is nothing other than Astarte, which is the queen of heaven. Now, no name could be more exactly. Uh, picture forth the character of Semiramis as queen of Babylon to the name Ashtart, which means the woman that made towers. So it's Ashtoreth then is obviously the same as Hebrew Ashtoreth, which one again, once again, it comes from the uh, two Babylons. This quote from Microsoft and Carta uh, Multimedia Encyclopedia, Ishtar was the great mother, the goddess of fertility and the queen of heaven. 
So in actuality, Astaroth, Ishtar, was Nimrod's harlotrous mother and wife, and his widow. Semiramis, as many other ancient historians attest, Easter is now established as none other than the Astaroth of the Bible. We can now examine the scriptures to show how God views the worship of this pagan goddess by any name. In uh, Judges 2, verses 11 and 13, and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of Adonai. They forsook Adonai and served Baal and Ashtaroth, or Easter. Uh, we read, put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you and prepare your hearts unto Adonai, serve him only. Then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and serve Adonai only. First Samuel 7, verses 3 and 4. What's wrong with you? You take a Christian, a pagan holiday like this and Christianize it. What's wrong with that? And then you worship God, worship Elohim, in the name of this pagan holiday. What's wrong with that? Well, it's a big deal, right? Not a big deal. They're the golden calf. Oh, the golden calf. Well, we're not worshiping the golden calf. We're now saying, of course they didn't either. Uh, we're now saying, this is just the way we're going to worship Elohim now. What's wrong with that? Yeah. It doesn't work that way. No. Yeah, they were told yes, it was, uh, not to do when it. They, when they went into the land not to inquire how they worshiped their gods and worship him. Exactly. That's Deuteronomy 12. The first four verses and the last four verses of Deuteronomy 12 say that. It says, don't worship me the way the pagans worship their gods. Why not? What's wrong with that? There's a lot wrong with that. Now, we're called, our relationship with our Heavenly Father, he's our Heavenly Father, and we also, which is, we can understand that. Because we have fathers, we have parents, and we are, we've been children, we have children. He also says the other relationship is, you're my bride, you're my wife. We understand that, but those are the two most intimate relationships that human beings can have. And that's how he says our relationship is with him. Now, let's take the example of the husband and wife. <clears throat> What's wrong with your wife, for instance, I'm a man, so let's say my wife, for instance, <clears throat> kept pictures of her, her first husband. She didn't have a first, not her first husband, but let's assume she is, was divorced and we remarried, like we've done with Elohim breaking up so many times and coming back to him like Israel did. Uh, what's, what's wrong with her having pictures of her ex-husband around, the one that used to beat her? What's wrong with that? What if, uh, I, I use this example sometimes, <clears throat> My birthday is June 3rd, but I come home on March 15th. And I walk in the door, my wife says, Happy birthday! It's not my birthday. And I made you your favorite meal spaghetti. I don't like spaghetti. Well, I mean, my favorite meal is fried chicken. Everybody knows me. No, really. Uh, by the way, is it March? 15th, your ex-husband's birthday? Yeah, but I wasn't thinking about him, I'm thinking about you. And that's why you make me spaghetti. Wasn't that his favorite meal? Yeah, that was his favorite meal, but don't think about that. I'm doing this for you. What's she really doing? Trying to get me into divorce court. <laughs> okay? Hello, he's the same way. What does he say his name was? Starts with a J. <laughs> His name is Jealous. What does that mean? See, jealousy is different. People confuse jealousy and envy. Okay, or coveting. For instance, uh, if someone is putting, you can see someone's hitting on your spouse. Going over there and say, uh, buddy, she's with me. Uh, why don't you pick on one of them single ladies over there? Now, that, I was jealous. Is that bad? Is that a bad thing? No. What does that mean, that I would go ahead and stop that? It means I love her. But she's mine. <clears throat> he doesn't want you messing around on him. Okay? Don't celebrate his birthday in December 25th in feeding spaghetti. Okay? 
Don't do that. Just in our own human relations, you can see how damaging that can be. You can see it. And he's not asking much out of us. My gosh, he says, don't eat poison. Get together on these certain days of the year and have parties with your friends, with like-minded people. Get together on the Sabbath day and don't do any work. Don't know. You, you, you take a nap. Well, the more I appreciate that. When I was a kid, oh, don't let me take a nap. No, I'm, can I go take a nap? <laughs> <laughs> uh, just do it. He, he doesn't ask that much. He doesn't ask that much. I try to those things out. His Torah doesn't consist in that many things for everybody. All of Torah is not for everybody. Some parts are just for women, some parts are just for men. A lot of it's just for them, they're Levites and priests. A lot of it's just for them. Oh, let's keep going here. The egg. The egg. Where did the eggs come from on Easter? A sacred symbol of rebirth and fertility among the Babylonians, Druids, Egyptians, and other pagan cultures. Dyed eggs were used as sacred offerings during the pagan Easter season. And were also used as symbols of the goddess Oster or Ishtar in various cultures. That's from the Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, this is a, a picture of uh, the Orphic god Thames is uh, emerging from the cosmic egg surrounded by the zodiac. Okay, from the second century AD. During the rule of Caesar Augustus, Hyginus, an Egyptian who was the librarian at the Palatine Library in Rome, wrote, An egg of a wondrous sight, it is said to have fallen from heaven into the river Euphrates. The fishes rolled it to the bank where the doves, having settled upon it, hatched it. Now King Venus, who afterwards was called the Syrian goddess Astarte. Part of their worship to this goddess was the ritual involving the golden egg of Astarte. This was where we got the tradition of the Easter egg. Pope Gregory forbid the followers of the Catholic Church to eat lay eggs during Lent, so they became a treat at Easter. Oh boy. The people in Poland said that the Virgin Mary dyed eggs in various colors for Jesus to play with when he was a child. <clears throat> yeah. I, I don't know. When I was a kid, you know, they used to tell Polak jokes. This is the reason why. It's one of these things. I want to get us. <laughs> The Ukrainians incorporated blue dots in the design of their eggs when they say they represent the tears of Mary. They believe she took a basket of colored eggs to Pontius Pilate as a gift in hopes of convincing him to have mercy on Jesus. As she was making them, she began crying and the tears fell on the shells, making the dots, of course. The Orthodox of Romania dyed their eggs red because they believe Mary left a basket of eggs at the cross during the crucifixion to appease the soldiers so they would treat Jesus better. They were not accepted, and his blood dripped on them. In, Mary, in Russia, there's a tradition that Mary Magdalene gave an egg to the Roman emperor as a symbol, symbolic token of the resurrection of Jesus. Okay. The egg was a mystical symbol to the pagan religions of Egypt, Japan, Greece, Persia, Phoenicia, India, and Babylon. On page 496, he wrote, the serpent entwined around the egg was a symbol of uh, was a symbol common to the Indians, the Egyptians, and the Druids. They referred to the creation of the universe. A serpent with an egg in his mouth was a symbol of the universe containing within itself the germ of all things that the sun develops. The property possessed by the serpent of casting its skin and apparently renewing its youth made an emblem of eternity and immortality. Thus, we see an indication that an egg initially represented serpent worship and, by extension, Satan worship. That comes from Albert Pike in his Masonic treatise, Morals and Dogma. Because the use of eggs was forbidden during Lent, they were brought to the table on Easter Day, colored red to symbolize the Easter joy. This custom is found not only in the Latin, but also in the Oriental churches. The symbolic meaning of the new creation of mankind by Jesus risen from the dead was probably an invention of later times. The custom may have its origin in paganism, for a great many pagan customs celebrating the return of spring gravitated to Easter. The egg is the emblem of the germinating life of early spring. Easter eggs, the children are told, come from Rome with the bells which on Thursday go to Rome 
and return Saturday morning. The sponsors in some countries give Easter eggs to their godchildren. Colored eggs were used by children at Easter in a sort of game which consists of testing the strength of the shells. Both colored and uncolored eggs were used in some parts of the United States for this game known as egg picking. Another practice is the egg rolling by children on Easter Monday on the lawn of the White House in Washington. <clears throat> in 1913, the Catholic Encyclopedia states that the Easter rabbit is a pagan symbol and has always been an emblem of fertility. Well, see, I told you, the Catholic Encyclopedia will tell on itself. It does not hesitate to do that. The rabbit or hare, a pagan symbol of fertility in your life, Bede, the 8th century English monk scholar, related that the Teutonic goddess of spring and fertility, Yoster, had the hair as her symbol. Comes from the American Book of Days by Jane Hatch. To begin with, it's actually the hare, not the rabbit, which is Easter's main character, because according to ancient tradition, the hare was symbolic representation for the moon, since they only come out at night to eat. Also, the Egyptian name for the hare was Un, which means open, because they're born with their eyes open, while the rabbits are not. Legend. Excuse me, legend has it that the hare never blinks or closes its eyes. To some pagan cultures, the moon was the open eyed watcher of the skies. The hare is associated with the goddess Ishtar and was a symbol of fertility because they reproduce so quickly. There's also a pagan tradition concerning a bird who wanted to be a rabbit, so the goddess Oster turned the bird into a rabbit who could still lay eggs. Every spring during the festival dedicated to Oster, the rabbit laid beautiful colored eggs for the goddess. This tradition was exemplified in the Cadbury television commercial for the filled chocolate eggs. Another tradition which has been passed down comes from Germany. According to the legend, during a famine, a poor woman dyed some eggs, hid them in a nest as Easter presents for her children. And when the children found the nest, a big rabbit licked away the story that the rabbit brought the eggs. So the Easter rabbit lays the eggs, for which reason they're hidden in a nest or a garden. The rabbit is a pagan symbol that has always been an emblem of fertility. Well, yeah, the encyclopedia. <clears throat> One more thing I'd like to mention. If you're still unsure as to the rabbit being used as a method of sexual symbolism, I suggest you ask the late Hugh Hefner, the publisher of Playboy magazine, why a bunny was used as his main logo. Good question. Easter ham, yum. Ham at Easter is also popular among Americans and Europeans because the pig was considered a symbol of luck in pre-Christian European culture. The pig was sacred to the Greek goddess uh, Demeter, the corn goddess who represented fertility and abundance is another counterpart of the star today. In various depictions of her, she's either shown carrying or being accompanied by a pig so pigs were regularly sacrificed to her. It was believed that by eating what they felt represented and embodied their, good, their goddess, they were in fact eating of her body. The prophet Isaiah warned of this in Isaiah 65, verses 3 through 5. Another source that says the pig represents the wild boar that killed Tammuz, and eating ham was done in remembrance of him. The tradition of Easter ham evolved from an English tradition of eating a gammon of bacon, to show their resentment and contempt for the Jewish custom of not eating pork. Hmm. In Isaiah 66, verse 17, those who sanctify and purify themselves to go to the gardens, following one in the center, who eat swine's flesh, detestable things, and mice, shall come to an end altogether, declares Yahweh. Does that say, if you eat unclean things, you're damned? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I mean, isn't that what it says? You know, I, I, wish, I wish I had Isaiah's email address so I could ask him about that. <laughs> you know? Um, I don't know how to argue with that. I don't know how to... Yeah, don't worry about that. You know. No, he says it'll come to an end altogether. That's that means in the final judgment you will be eliminated. 
Don't leave it. Okay, now, by the way, uh, hell is not uh, a place where people get eternally, eternally tortured. No, it's not what that is. Just the judgment will come and you'll, you'll be done away with it. All right? Oh, uh, excuse me. They will come to an end altogether. Let's put it that way. That's inarguable in my opinion. Any questions on that? See, that's the problem with Easter. Okay? That's a problem with it, and it's a big problem. Well, they celebrate Passover, but the day before they celebrate what they call Memorial Supper. Okay? Um, why? I, I, I'm just going to tell you why, they, why we don't. Okay? Um, the did Yeshua and his, and his disciples celebrate Passover together, or was it a memorial supper? Something to do the day before Passover. Uh, well, I'll tell you right off the bat, there's no such thing as memorial supper. It's a manufactured holiday based upon the Christian tradition of the alleged Lord's Supper. Uh, Yeshua didn't make up a new holiday when he celebrated his last Passover with his disciples. He specifically stated that he was state celebrating Passover with them. <clears throat> Matthew 26, verse 17. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Yeshua saying, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? Verse 18, and he said, go into the city to a certain man. Say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I am to keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Yeshua had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. Okay? In Mark, chapter 14, starting in verse 12, on the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed. By the way, the reason it said first day of unleavened bread, they kind of combined both Sometimes when they referred to them, Passover and unleavened bread, just combined it and referred to Passover as the day of preparation. Because that's the last day to get all the leaven, uh, leaven out of your house. So we see people, it's mentioned one time, but it's today's the preparation day. People think, oh, that's Friday before Sabbath. No, no, that's not what that means. You don't really have to prepare that much for the Sabbath. Okay? You got to prepare, you got spring cleaning came from a uh, feast of unleavened bread and getting ready for it. Okay, but in the very last day, you, you've got till Passover to get that done. So he sent two of his disciples, said, Go to the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water, follow him. Wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, the teacher says, Where is my guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He himself will show you a large upper room furnished and ready and prepare for us there. And then in Luke's version, go and prepare the Passover for us. We may eat it. Verse 11, where's the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Uh, you don't want me to uh, keep finding verses in the no, Gospels. Is that good? Okay, Paul's got it now. All right, so we can move on. I'm a slow one, too, so if I got it, everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> the Memorial Supper, usually celebrated with unleavened bread or crackers with wine or grape juice, along with foot washing. However, the scriptures plainly state that they ate the Passover supper or meal and not just the bread and wine. It does say that. Matthew 26, verse 26, and while they were eating, Yeshua took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it, gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. So they were eating the, the Passover meal. Uh, a lot of people have said, uh, we shouldn't do a Seder, because Yeshua didn't do a Seder in Passover. Well, okay, that's fine. I, I won't argue with that, because we can't prove that he did a Seder. However, he did explain the elements of the bread and the wine and their significance, which is what you do at the Passover, is you explain the elements that you're eating. Um, 
and you're supposed to retell the story of the Exodus and the account of Yeshua now on Passover, well, you won't do that with the Seder. It's one everyone can participate in, and I think it's great. Um, it's not adding to or taking away. It's actually very obedient to do just what we do. <clears throat> and, and Mark, it says the same thing. While they were eating, took some bread. And in John's version, interestingly enough, in chapter 13, verse, starting in verse 2, and during the supper, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Yeshua, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come forth from Elohim and was going back to Elohim, rose from the supper, laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself about. So, you know, church is doing the Lord's Supper thing. Uh, there's a couple things wrong with that. The term for supper, the, how many times does it say Lord's Supper in Scripture? That does that once in uh, 1 Corinthians. However, that word for supper also means feast, which is interesting. And then you know what Passover is called in Exodus several times? Yahweh's feast, Lord's Supper, Yahweh's feast, same thing. <clears throat> Why did he celebrate it so early? People say, well, he celebrated too early for it to really be Passover. Well, the obvious answer is he knew that he was going to be killed when the Passover lamb was sacrificed later that day. But there's more to it than that. The Passover observance was sometimes celebrated by the Pharisees on one day and by the Sadducees on the following day. Whether this was because of a dispute over the sighting of the new moon is not clear. Also, it's common to practice the Seder meal the day before in order for the memorial to go smoother. Regardless, Yeshua and his disciples did not eat the Passover until the 14th of Aviv, as the sun had already gone down before they started. Now, it says, then came the first day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. And they said to him, Where do you want us to prepare it? Now, this brings some issues here. Um, the Passover lamb is not sacrificed on the first day of unleavened bread. It's sacrificed the day before. But they sometimes considered Passover to go ahead and be the first day of unleavened bread. Okay? Well, and that word for came also could be coming. So, then coming to the day of unleavened bread, and by the way, first is not there. It was inserted. This was evening because it was the day that the Passover lamb was going to be sacrificed. The sun had gone down on the 13th of Abib. It's now the 14th before they started celebrating the feast. So, actually, we're celebrating on the right day, just many hours early on that day. Also, let me state the passage saying when the Passover is to be sacrificed means between the evenings. Uh, and that's that term uh, translated as twilight. Leviticus 23, verse 5, in the first month on the 14th day of the month at twilight between the evenings is Yahweh's Passover. Remember I told you that's what they call it. Any questions on that? No memorial supper, it's all as far as as far as I'm concerned, it's all it's Passover. Like, what? So the day of Passover is also the first day of the Sometimes it's considered that way. No, it's not, but sometimes it's considered that way. They kind of sometimes they bundle it all together. Since Passover is just that first day, uh, it's the preparation day for the Feast of Olive and Bread. Anybody else? Any thoughts? We're going to cover one more thing here. Uh, and, and by the way, these scriptures says we'll go back to verse by verse stuff again. Right after we get uh, we start broadcasting again, which our IT department is working very hard on accomplishing that for us, and we sure appreciate that department. Thanks, Charlie. <clears throat> 
Speaking, speaking of Passover, if you guys are coming and haven't signed up yet, that information is on that front table, and along with the calendar for the month and um, some other things. So please check out that table too. And you know what? We're just going to go ahead and have Bible study before we have a break. We're going to tough it through. Paul, did you bring your friend this evening? I did. He wanted to come back for another visit. Oh, man. I like that guy. I mean, I really like that guy. Oh, man. This, this has caused anguish. Now, this caused big times anguish with people. Uh, how many of you, you've heard, I'm sure a lot of you have heard this. If you've been around Messianic circles, well, there they are. Welcome. Hey, they're here from Miami. It, it takes a little while to get here. <laughs> now, if you've been involved with Messianic people for very long, you have heard the crucifixion did not happen on a Friday, it happened on a Wednesday. Now, how many of y'all have heard that? I wish Oscar were here because uh, he was still try trying to grasp onto that. Uh, if that originally came from the Worldwide Church of God, the Herbert Armstrong group, which they had a lot of things correct, uh, but this wasn't one of them. And I'll, uh, I'll talk to you about that as to why that is. There's, a, there's several reasons. There are innumerable arguments and claims by Messianics that Christians are wrong for claiming that the Messiah was crucified on a Friday when he was actually crucified on a Wednesday. Unfortunately, proponents of the Wednesday crucifixion presupposition have only given their premise a cursory view without thorough investigation whatsoever. In reality, the alleged Wednesday crucifixion poses more logistical difficulties than does the Friday hypothesis. Now, by the way, if you believe in the Wednesday crucifixion, that removes the possibility of Yeshua being the Messiah. Well, really? Where'd you get that? I'm going to show you. <laughs> there are three weak reasons why, I'm going to give you four actually, why this scenario is impossible to reconcile. First one, I had a problem with this. Right when the first person told me, Wednesday crucifixion, I thought, what about Friday? The claims that Messiah was crucified on Wednesday before sundown and resurrected shortly after sundown on the first day of the following week. They say Passover was on that Wednesday. Then Thursday was a high Sabbath because it's the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. No, no work, right? Yeah. What about Friday? Why didn't they go and treat the body on Friday? Why didn't they spice it up then? Okay, here was the reason I got it. Friday was spice gathering day. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> Saturday was a weekly Sabbath. Yeshua rose from the grave after the sun on the on Saturday. They said this is the only way to satisfy the requirements of him being in the grave three days and three nights, as he said, would happen. Okay. Uh, we're told in Luke that the spices and perfumes were prepared before the Sabbath started. In Luke 23, verses 54 through 56, and it was the preparation day and the Sabbath was about to begin. Now the women who had come with him out of Galilee followed after and saw the tomb and how his body was laid, and they returned and prepared spices and perfumes, and on the Sabbath they rested according to the commandment. So where did they get them from? Uh, in John, we're told that Joseph of Arimathea not only donated his grave for Messiah, but Nicodemus also donated the 100 pounds of spices with which the body would be buried. That's in John 19, starting in verse 38. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Yeshua, but a secret one, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Yeshua. And Pilate granted permission. He came, therefore, and took away his body. And Nicodemus came also, who had first come to him by night, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds weight. 
Now, I read, and I don't know how accurate how they even do this for sure, but they said they normally did about a pound of spices for every two pounds of body weight. So that would make Yeshua 200 pounds, which may have been, I don't know. They don't show him, he doesn't look like he's 200 pounds in those movies and documentaries they show him in. But maybe they didn't know either. So they took the body of Yeshua, bound in linen wrappings with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which uh, no one had been yet laid. Therefore, on account of the Jewish day of preparation, because the tomb was nearby, they laid Yeshua there. Okay. So, was the death of Messiah really on a Wednesday? Well, Passover occurs on the 14th day of the month. And if that is Wednesday, he died at 3 p.m. And then at sundown, starts the first day of Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then we have the Sabbath until sunset. Now we have the sunset on Thursday. There's a free day here. What did they do with that free day? Did they really not care? No, they were up early on Sunday morning. Before the sun came up, the women were on their way there and ran a lot to them. They wanted to take care of the body of Messiah. There was no spice gathering day, whatever. And here's the other problem. <laughs> After the sun goes down on the Sabbath day, here on Saturday night, resurrection comes after three days. It's as soon as it could be, it's three days and six hours. Mm, what happened on the third day? Well, as it was, the women were eager to finish preparing the body early in the morning, the first day of the week. They certainly would not have lazed around doing nothing on Friday when they could have finished preparing the body at that time. The Wednesday crucifixion hypothesis means that the body would have been in the ground four days and would stinketh, according to the King James translation, by Sunday morning. John 11, verse 39 says, Yeshua said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Master, by this time he stinketh. For he had been dead four days. Now what's the purpose of, uh, of wanting to put the spices in on the body? They didn't want it to stink it. Okay? But you know, there's a lot of people that, you know, where we find mummies, and they, they'll show that Yeshua was wrapped up like a mummy. Um, where did the, this mummy thing is most popular in ancient Egypt, was it not? But, the, uh, the Egyptians didn't believe in a, in, in a physical afterlife. They believed in a spiritual afterlife. But there were a certain group of people that knew there was a resurrection coming that happened to be slaves there for a long time. That's likely where this mummy, this mummification process came from, is from the ancient Israelites. Mark 16, 1 states that the women bought spices early that morning, the first day of the week, but that does nothing to bolster the imagined premise they gathered spices all day long on that Friday. The imagined spice gathering day falls flat. There is no explanation for Lazy Disciple Friday with a Wednesday crucifixion. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. There's another resurrected prior to the end of Sabbath, really close to the end of Sabbath, so that it disputes those who worship on Sunday as the resurrection day. They may it be the Sabbath that he resurrected on. Well, yeah, but technically, according to the, the way Christianity keeps time anyway, he, he resurrected probably after the sun went down, which still would have been Saturday night by their reckoning, not Sunday. By Christian reckoning. See what I mean? It would still be like 7 30, 8 o'clock on Saturday night. Before the sun? No, oh, no. If, if you waited until the end of the Sabbath to rise, which makes sense. Right. Then, but, they're, but they're actually saying he, he rose 
prior to the sun going down so that it actually was the Sabbath that he rose on, so it disputes the Sunday people that say they're celebrating right. Sunday for the resurrection day. Right, but my point so is that 730... Sabbath is a Sabbath. We don't need to make all these rules to make him rise on Sabbath to dispute that Sunday is not the day we should... Right, right. You see, by, by Christian accounting, 8 o'clock on Saturday night is still Saturday. By in the Christian mindset. Although, according to scripture, it's now Sunday. Or the first day of the week. So, um, yeah, and, but that is, that is just one. I'm, other. Talking, I'm talking about Sabbath keepers. Oh, yeah, I understand. People that are actually Sabbath keepers are saying that, that do the Wednesday thing. They're actually saying that. Right, right. There's a couple more issues that are even stronger than that. Uh, the, on the third day, that's what we're talking about. So he would have to have resurrected before three o'clock on Saturday afternoon. Uh, which I think that would have been noticed. But um, he said it would be, it'd be on the third day. From the time Yeshua Messiah began to show his disciples he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and scribes and be killed he, and be raised up on the third day. That on the third day is mentioned nine times in the Gospels alone. It's mentioned at least once in Acts and also mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, 4, with Yeshua being buried before sundown on Thursday, resurrecting after the weekly Sabbath. He's in the ground less than three full days, less than 72 hours, making it on the third day that he's raised. This is in complete agreement with everything in the church. <laughs> On the other hand, Messianics want to use one passage and read into it something that is not there. The one passage is Matthew 12, 40. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Uh, there's only one witness to this. This is not mentioned any place else in Scripture. Just that one place in Matthew. Uh, the quote from Jonah is used as a simile, but... Jonah does not say that Messiah would be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. So the statement's only made once. Uh, that doesn't negate the passage, but the weightier point is definitely the 11 times in the Brit Shah, and by the way, Hosea 6 2, saying he'll resurrect on the third day, not after three days. So uh, if we have a uh, death at 3 p.m., Excuse me, then 3 p.m. on Thursday is the end of the first day. 3 p.m. on Friday is the second day. 3 p.m. on the Sabbath is the end of the third day. The 3 o'clock. Resurrection came after the sunset on the fourth day. You know what she said could be. That's what they have to, that's what they would have to uh, postulate is yes, they resurrected on Saturday in the middle of the day. I don't think so. I think that would have been noticed. Uh, keep in mind, the tomb, the tomb was guarded. Uh, and that would be good guard duty, to guard a dead man. That would be, you'd think easy. It wasn't easy that one time. <clears throat> uh, and also, you know that many people were watching that tomb. They knew the, the world shook. They knew that the temple uh, veil had been ripped from top to bottom. They knew that, that the world underwent several hours of darkness. That's recorded in secular uh, writings. Do you think the people were keeping an eye on that too? Oh yeah, they were. Pat, yeah. Is there any explanation for that? The sun came out in what, three, it was three hours. Yeah, three hours of darkness. Yeah, I mean, that's not an eclipse. Really. No, it's not an eclipse because an eclipse can only happen during a new moon. Yeah. So, yeah, that was a supernatural event. It was a supernatural event. There's no doubt about it. And if I'm not mistaken, there's at least two ancient writings that document that. That had nothing to do with Scripture. The claim by many Messianics is this must mean at least three full days and three full nights. When it says three days and three nights. 
Then they use the following passage to show that if Yeshua says a day, he meant 12 hours. John 11, verse 9, Yeshua answered, Are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. Well, Yeshua is not trying to say there's 12 hours exactly every day because there aren't. There's only 12 hours in a day, two days a year. And that's when the equinox occurs. He's telling them he's got to go back to Judah and they have to walk in the light of day of the Father's will, even though the Pharisees want to kill him. Yeah, I think, you know, the way I interpret that is mm -hmm. that they use sundials to measure time. And so all the sundials had 12 hours. Yeah, okay, so good. But December and January, the days were going to be shorter than they were in June and July. Didn't they have sundials have lights on them at night so they can, like your Gee. clock radio? Yeah. <laughs> well, that passage is, is what, it, what he means here. Uh, he's telling them to go back to Judah. They have to walk in the light of the day of the Father's will. And this is what he said. It's in John 11, starting at verse 7. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. And are you going there again? Yeshua answered, are there not 12 hours in a day? If anyone walks in the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. So that's not the point. He's not trying to prove how long a day he is. Now, a passage is more applicable is a parable of the workers, get, workers getting paid a day's wage when someone, some were even hired toward the end of the day instead of the beginning of the day. Remember that one? A portion of the day can be considered a day, and that's true in everyday usage. Does putting in a day's work mean you work 12 hours? Does it mean that? No. If you say you traveled on a three-day trip, but you only traveled 2.6 days, did you tell a lie? No. Yeshua died at three, was in the grave for some unspecified time before the sun went down. Joseph of Arimathea got permission to bury the body, wrapped it in a cloth, and set it in his tomb. Matthew 27, starting at verse 58, this man went to Pilate, asked for the body of Yeshua, and Pilate ordered it to be given over to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, laid it in his new tomb, in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock, and he rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb, and went away. Now since he apparently was crucified on a Thursday, which by the way fits everything, he is in the grave Thursday, Thursday night, Friday, which is a special Sabbath, Friday night, Saturday the weekly Sabbath, and Saturday night. And he arose on the third day after the Sabbath rests were complete, three days, three nights. Now, here's the real kicker, at least to me. The Wednesday crucifixion makes Messiah and those who greeted him as he rode into Jerusalem sinners. The Wednesday crucifixion folks say Passover, which is the 14th day of Aviv, was on a Wednesday. That means that Yeshua rode into Jerusalem on a previously unridden beast on the Sabbath day, which would have been the 10th of Aviv. It also means that the crowd who broke off branches off the streets to honor him were in sin also. Yeshua rode into Jerusalem on the 10th of Abib in fulfillment of the original command to bring the Passover lamb into the house on that day. In Exodus 12, starting at verse 3, speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the 10th of this month, there to each one take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's households, a lamb for each household, now, if the household's too small for a lamb, then his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them. According to what each man should eat, you are to divide the lamb. Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. So... If the crucifixion was a Wednesday, then the tenth of Abib was a Sabbath day. Because you have, you've got the 14th is a Wednesday, Tuesday is a 
13th. Monday is the 12th. Sunday was the 11th. The Sabbath day would have been the 10th if Wednesday is a crucifixion day. So here, this is the premise here. Then, if Wednesday is the day, Yeshua breaks the Sabbath, rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. People break Sabbath by cutting off branches off the trees. <clears throat> and then, you see where the problem is? Then the Passover doesn't, then the crucifixion doesn't follow the Passover. It doesn't follow along with the way the Passover is, is uh, designated in Scripture. <clears throat> So, Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread are considered one feast. The Passover day itself is considered the preparation day for the beginning of the feast, which is a high Sabbath. And here's what happened. If you look at Matthew 21, starting at verse 6, the disciples went and did just as Yeshua had directed them, brought the donkey and the colt, laid on them their garments on which he sat, and most of the multitude spread their garments on the ground. Others were cutting branches from the trees, spreading them in the road, the multitudes going before him and those who followed after were crying out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh, Hosanna in the highest. Now, if the penalty for picking up sticks on the Sabbath is death, can you climb the trees and cut the limbs out on that day? No, you cannot. Aren't all the animals supposed to rest too? So why would he ride an un previously unridden donkey on the Sabbath day? He wouldn't. He wouldn't. You see, uh, in John 12, starting in verse 12, the next day the great multitude had come to the feast when they heard that Yeshua was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of palm trees and went to meet him began to cry out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh, even the king of Israel. And Yeshua, finding a young, don young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. The Wednesday crucifixion hypothesis shows Yeshua and the people definitely breaking the Sabbath. While beasts should be fed and watered on the Sabbath, they are to rest on the Sabbath, just like the people. That's in Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. Also, let's not forget that even picking up sticks, not to mention breaking off branches, is a violation of the Sabbath day. So they, they had Passover Wednesday night. Wednesday night, yes, exactly. They had Passover Wednesday night. There's one other thing. One other thing. The 70 weeks of Daniel. You know... I studied this, uh, and I, I came across a book, and, I, and I'm mentioning it here. It's uh, it's called The Coming Prince, and it was written in like 1906. It was written by the Chief Inspector of Scotland Yard, Sir Robert Anderson, and in that he proposed a couple of things in interpreting prophecy or at least interpreting the 70 weeks of Daniel. <coughs> and that is, a day can be considered a year in prophecy. It's symbolic, and that's scriptural. That's scriptural. Uh, why, did the, why did Israel wander in the wilderness for 40 years? Why 40 years? Because they spent 40 days spying out the land. Okay, and he said, ah, for every day you did that, it's a year. Uh, Ezekiel is told to lay down on one side for 390 days and then flip over on the other side for 44. And he said, for 390 days, I'm gonna, my face is going to be turned against Israel a year for every day. And then 40 more days for Judah. 430 years for them. Okay. I took that day equals a year thing. And according to Sir Robert Anderson, the Chief Inspector Scott the Yard did some great research on this, and it's very hard to take, to go backwards in time and find out when a new moon occurs if you go back more than a few hundred years. Okay? You go back 2,000 years, that's not easy to tell exactly which day 
the new moon is. But he said, according to his calculations, the new moon occurred on a Thursday. Or excuse me, Passover occurred on a Thursday that year. Passover did. And with that being the case, in 32 AD is when it happened. That's according to Daniel, Daniel 70 weeks, the first 69 weeks tells us exactly the day. And by the way, using that same formula in, in prophecy, a day equals a year. And by the way, the other thing he said back in that day, in Daniel's day, they considered a year to be 360 days. They didn't consider a year to be exactly the, uh, the earth going around the sun one time. They just considered it 360 days. And then every few years, they add in a, another 30-day month. And by the way, come to find out, it's a very accurate way to do it. So if you remember, a year is 360 days, and a day can be a year. I went through the book of Ezekiel in chapter 4. Remember the 390 days I told you of Israel laying on the ground, and then Judah on the other side? So that was 430, so we had a, had a situation there. But if you look at Leviticus chapter 26, Yeshua, or Elohim says this. He says, I'm going to punish you when you disobey, when you're disobedient. I'm going to punish you. <clears throat> and if you still don't turn back to me, I'm going to multiply that punishment times seven. Hmm. Okay. So you take 390, multiply that times Seven. Let's back up first. What happened with Judah? They were taken in captivity in Babylon 70 years, correct? So you take the 430 years, subtract 70 out, and they still didn't come back. So if you multiply the 360 years by seven, did you know that from the very time that the second that the first temple was destroyed and they were taken into captivity by Babylon? If you take that very day that it happened and add those seven times 360 years. You know what day you come to? May 15th, 1948. And I'm not kidding. Absolutely amazing. That's in our study on Ezekiel 4. What about the 390? The Northern Kingdom, they really didn't have a trial period. And they were evil from day one. They were evil from the begin beginning. You can look at all the kings of the northern kingdom, not one of them, but worth shooting. All evil. 390, days, 390 years. If you go back to when Israel was taken captive by Assyria and spread throughout the world, the very day that that happened, 732 or something, and take that 390 years times seven and add it to that, that day, you know what you come to? June 10th, 1967. The end of the seven days war. The six days war. And I'm telling you, I was, I, I, I couldn't believe what I read. I couldn't believe what my calculator told me. But it comes to exactly that, that time. If you think that that nation that is Israel today, I've heard people say, those people there, they're not righteous. They're not a righteous group. Well, you know, I, I may have a little problem with my own righteousness. I don't know who can declare, who can declare someone's good enough for this or not. When will the people that are in that place be good enough? I don't know. When will the people in this room be good enough? I don't know. But if Elohim says, my face is no longer turned against you, You've got blessings coming. And that's what's happened over there. They've been blessed greatly. Gosh, if you look up at a globe map of that whole area, okay, all the Middle East is just brown. What does brown mean? Desert. Wilderness. This little spot in the middle. A little green spot. What's that little green spot? The nation of Israel. How'd that happen? How did that happen? <clears throat> but anyway, Sir Robert Anderson, he says Yeshua ruled Jerusalem on April 6, 32 AD, according to the same calculations.
And according to his thorough investigation, others have come up with various other specific days of the week for that year. I trust his research better than any others, and I read his. This is pretty impressive. Passover in 32 AD was a Thursday. And I don't know why people have a problem with that. The people that really love that Wednesday crucifixion refuse to admit that Thursday is a much, much, much better fit in every way, shape, and form than Wednesday or Friday. <clears throat> Any questions on that? Any thoughts? Complaints? Paul? <laughs> Gripes? The list is long. <laughs> so you yeah, we'll say that for another day. Yeah. So you said that you can you go back more than what you said, 100 years? Several hundred, let's say seven or 800 years, yeah. It's difficult to be real precise as to when a new moon has appeared, especially, especially to know when it's visible. <coughs> then you, I mean, that's hard to say. <laughs> We never know from month to month for sure if the moon new moon's going to be visible anyway. So for us, and, and but we got to get this first one right. That's the one coming up. Yeah, the, the first one and the seventh one; those are the important ones to get right, as as good as you can. Yeah. Well, I sh I don't I didn't get it on Thursday. How do you, how do you get how did you explain the three days? Okay, Thursday get third because he was, he died Thursday at three, so that's Thursday, Thursday night, Friday, Friday night, Saturday, Saturday night. Okay, three days, three nights, and the fact that okay Thursday at three is when he died. You have until Sunday at three to be on the third day. Okay, it'll be after the second day. Uh, come come Saturday at three. That was two days. So on the third day is between Saturday at 3 and Sunday at 3. So after the sun goes down on Saturday, there's your, there's your on the third day. All right. Did that three hours of darkness not be? No, because that didn't count. That didn't affect the day. It just affected the visibility. Um, if, if you want, um, like I said, we'll be going back to verse by verse things. I'd rather get them wait till we're broadcasting because I don't want to have to go back and redo them in a few weeks just to get them on video, on YouTube, okay? Um, would anybody be interested in looking at Ezekiel 4 with the time frames that I just mentioned to you? Anybody be interested in that? Okay. Yeah, it's a hoot. And, and, let me, uh, who has a Bible? Anybody have a Bible? Yeah, I need bigger print. Okay. This is, uh, this is a very interesting Passage also going back to Daniel and his 70 weeks. And that's in Daniel chapter 9. <clears throat> now it talks about the first 69 weeks. That's when Messiah comes. It says, And he'll make a firm covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he'll put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that's decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Okay, I thought, I had a problem with this. I couldn't figure out what this meant for years. And then I looked up other translations. It says, uh, some can say, instead of make a firm covenant, he will uh, make firm the covenant with many for one week. So what's a week? Look, that's a, all it was was a seven. That's all it means is a seven. Well, Israel's penalties were multiplied times seven. And I thought, is this the week he's talking about? If it's that week that Israel's 390 times seven, he says in the middle of the week, he'll put a, he'll put 
put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that's decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. So I thought, well, okay, then in the middle of the week, he's going to absolutely put a stop to grain offerings and sacrifices. And that which makes desolate will come on the wing of abominations in the middle of that week. So I took the 390 times 7. <clears throat> And that was uh, 2,730 years, I believe. <laughs> I believe, it's, let's just go with that. So it's 2,730 years. So I went, and I put on that timeline there, ending in June 10th, 1967, and went back to 732, and I went, let's go right in the middle of that week. What year is that? Right in the middle of that week, I see year 621. Well, what does 621 have to do with it? I don't know. But it sounded like it, it sounded Islamic to me. So I looked up 621 Islam. You can Google, Google it like I did. 621 AD Islam. Guess what? That's year zero on the Islamic calendar. That's year zero. Mm -hmm. That's the year Islam started. That's the year it started. With that in mind, let me read this again. He'll make a firm covenant. He'll make firm the covenant with Israel for a seven. In other words, he's not turning back from it. They're going to be punished that long. But in the middle of the week, he'll put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the, what better way to do that than bring Islam into the picture? And on the way of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that's decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Uh, remember I told you if you look at a global map, the whole area is all brown? Why is that? Who lives in that area? In all that brown area? Muslims. Muslims do. Does that look desolate to you? Are they that which makes desolate? Yeah. When have they ever gone into a city, state, country, and improved it? Never. They don't stop their job. They are that which makes desolate. What are they trying to do? Oh, you, you know, jihad is their, is their form of uh, uh, battle against evil, let's say. And the battle against evil consists of killing the infidel. You know, I've seen more, I've read more, or heard more about Muslims killing each other than killing infidels like you and me. But if you look in history, and this was done by Thomas Sowell, if you know who he is, and you count up how many non-Muslims were killed through jihad since 621, you know what number you get? Non-Muslims that's documented in history killed through jihad 739 million. Sound like a great tribulation to you? It's exactly what it is. We are so shielded from this in the West, it's unbelievable. But the beast is Islam. No doubt about it. I, I, I've thoroughly documented that. The little horn was Muhammad speaking blasphemous things. It fits, it fits, it's it. <sighs> Boy, I chased some rabbits there. Okay. <laughs> Uh, hey, you. <laughs> we, uh, uh, anybody else? Any thoughts? Okay, let's pray. And uh, have some fellowship. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we've had together. Um, we pray, Father, that we hold your word uh, near and dear to our hearts, uh, that we have a stronger belief and obedience. In, in what you've told us. We pray, Father, you draw us closer to you and that you continue to write your Torah on our hearts and minds. This we pray as your humble servants. Amen. Amen.